goes we're live so guys here i am i know that beetle guy is just chomping at the bit so i'm here sandy's here we got so many people here hard pill to swallow pelly aunt sandy i think i said that already wally's here we've got jedi monkey aaron roth who else is here so many people here already if i missed you i'm sorry it's because i missed you all week chris h i expect more um, so this is the most excited I think people have been before the episode. I've gotten more comments and messages from this episode uh, before we air than any other episode I've done. And this is like number 80, I think, number 80 interviews. Um, so this is Easy Eddie, Eddie Lopez from Easy Eddie. <laughs> so we're going to get some really good information tonight, guys. I have put together a list. Um, and we just altered it a little bit, but I've put together a list of isopods that I think kind of cover the range of isopod keeping. So we're going to go from dairy cows all the way to Jupiter's. So we're going to go and, and take that journey together. Um, so Eddie has got, I don't know, like 250 colonies or species, um, having success with most, if not all. He's doing some things that I think are super innovative, doing things I've never seen before, taking that to the next level. Um, but we're going to get into that in a minute. I, you're going to be amazed just by the, the bins that are surrounding him right at this second. I'm looking at it right now. His background is amazing. Um, so, guys, without further ado, let's bring Eddie on, okay? Eddie, thanks for coming on today. No problem. I appreciate it. I know uh, this is out of most people's comfort zone, so I appreciate you being here. Um, Definitely out of mine. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. We, we've had a nine-year-old who has crippling social anxiety come on the show and totally fall in love with the format. So I'm confident you'll be okay. It's a safe zone. If you feel uh, threatened at all, just yell pangolins and we'll, we'll bop out. That's our safe word. <laughs> so, okay. Um, we've got so many people. All right, Vika Bubbles is on. All right, I think we're going to – that's about it. That's all I'm going to uh, – acknowledge right now so good crowd good crowd with gonna have some good questions here today so oh bug hub jose avila's here i'm guessing a lot of your friends are going to be here tonight which is most people that are in the hobby i think um i feel bad that i didn't know about you till i met ryan pavy so um he's the one that mentioned you to me and then i started to do some reading and, and ask around and yeah, I don't know a lot of the big names. Like, I didn't know who you were at all. I didn't know who a lot of these people are, but I'm super I, honored. I like it that way. Yeah, that's how you want to be? Okay. Well, don't worry. My 12 <laughs> people that watch this, are they're not going to beat down your door. <laughs> so, it's, they're in a real small community right now. Um, but they're all good people. I swear to you, they're all good people. I love every one of my audience members. Um, so, now, how many colonies do you have, roughly? Uh, well, I have 250 bins, and okay. last I counted, 184 species slash morphs. 184 species morphs. Okay. And I would guess, from talking to you, I'd guess a lot of that is species rather than morphs. Yeah. There's, well, things like Scaber, I have like 15 morphs, I think, of them. I think but it's everybody that is Scaber. There's a, lot, there's a lot of species, though. There's something for everybody in Scaber. And guys, we're going to cover Scaber in a minute. True. Um. So I think that's great. I think that's just great. And I think that your, um, you not being a morph master, which so there's something to be said for that. That's great. But the fact that you're branching out and doing some actual research, like some in-house research on these species and to kind of update their care needs and uh, husbandry is super interesting. Like I, you don't know how much all week I want to just blow up your phone and be like, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Um, because you just talking have. to you briefly. I know, I, I know. Except for when I was in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's it's been a rough week for a lot of people this week. So I'm at the end of COVID, but it's still sticking around. Um, I slept 10 hours in the middle of the day yesterday. Um, you're dealing with stuff. My daughter, there's so many people are sick right now or coming out of being sick that it's just crazy. So, uh, oh, Biggs is here too. Chris Biggs. Um, and Aqua Garden Zen, good times. So... That said, can we should we get into it? Did you have anything else you want sure. to say before we start? No, let's go. Love it. All right, we'll stick to the guns. Okay, so the first species I want to cover kind of is dairy cows. Um, and I, in my experience, they're the easiest thing I've mm -hmm. ever kept. Like 
ever anything that I've ever kept is dairy cows are number one. Um, if you can't get dairy cows to breed, don't keep isopods. That's my that's my opinion. So if you get 12 and six months later, you have 12 or less, just stop. Just stop there. Um, what is your top shelf dairy cow like? I know you probably still keep them with the same dedication that you keep all of your I do. species. I do, just not as many. Um, that does bring up something I'd like to say, though. I, I think I see a lot of people kind of shying away or being afraid to keep species they're not familiar with. Sure. And quite honestly, if you do your research and like ask a lot of questions and, you know, take your time and set up your bins before or your enclosures before you get them and everything, there's not that many to be scared of. The only ones that I would say to wait until you're super experienced with are the long spiky ones. Those have probably been the biggest okay. challenge. But other than that, even the, you know, most of the quote unquote Cubaris and the Marilinellas and all those, I, I don't think they've been like, super difficult or that anybody should have a super difficult time with them as long as they do their research and set things up properly. Yeah. I think a lot of it for me is uh, the more I'm going to invest in those ice pods is more research I'm going to do, to be honest. Like I want to give everybody as much husbandry as possible. If I'm going to drop $600 on 10 bugs or, or yeah. less, you know, um, I want to make sure that they're getting the best. So with, uh, with Percelio Lavis, I mean, I when I started, I had all pretty much all of them, different morphs I could get and everything. And yeah. I still keep a number of them. But I think the biggest challenge was what to do with all the babies. <laughs> like, they're, they're just so prolific and scabers the same way. That was like the biggest challenge. What have you got in Lavis? I, I know that there's the dairy cow. I know that there's orange. Yeah. Um, milk, milk back. Uh, milk backs, cow. yes. Uh trying to remember which ones I still have. I, I think I still have a half a dozen different ones. Milkback is honestly, I think, one of the most underrated isopods. Like, oh, I Rob. love them. Yeah, I do too. They, have, they have the good size. They have that, like, the dairy. Yeah. They're not, I don't think, mine weren't as prolific as my dairy cows. Um, but I love the markings on them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the white ones that come from the dairy cows. Okay. That are okay. white. I haven't seen the all white ones. That would be kind of cool to see too, without the spots. Um, I recently saw a Rorschach isopod that I was like, this isn't an ink blot. I said, dairy cows are the Rorschach. <laughs> we can't, it's too late to rename them, but it's totally what it is. Um, so, what would be the tip for Lavis? Like, like, particularly population control, besides just wholesaling or something like I, that's how I got rid of mine too, is I sold like a thousand for under a hundred dollars, you know, like they were like yeah. a penny a piece or something. Yeah. Um, I, I've known Cause what I did was I sold off like 15,000 of them for like 200 bucks. And then I moved what I had left into like smaller bins okay. and that seems to be working. It's not like I see more dead ones or them eating each other or anything, but they don't seem to, overpopulate any more than they did in the big ones it's just a smaller bin okay that makes sense there's less space so they don't yeah. really yeah i've got them in seven quarts now and there was a time when i had them in like multiple 44s wow okay okay i've got mine in a 15 now and and uh like i said i just sold off 95 percent of them a couple months ago and i'm still at re manageable <laughs> numbers so but i'm sure it'll come to that again where i'm just giving them away I think the Lavis are a really good like starter isopod. If you want to, if you're not sure if you're going to get into isopods or not, I think like the Lavis is a really good spot to start out with. And I, I think for the vast majority of the pods, when I was first learning that understanding, you know, that they need humidity to breathe, right? If, if yeah. they don't have humidity, they're going to die. So trying to understand how moisture and humidity are different from one another and being able to set up like moisture and humidity, like gradients and micro gradients within your bin gives them all the options of, you know, where they can go, where they need to be. And then they can actually, each colony will tell you like what it needs, right? If you find them all bunched up on the wet end that has all the moisture all the time and they never go to the dry end, obviously there's a humidity issue on the dry end, right? Or vice versa, yeah. if they're never on the wet end and they're always on the dry end, you have the opposite problem. 
So they'll they'll tell you what they need. I think that's great about it too. That and you get to see it in that microclimate level. So you get to kind of see and adjust and go from there. So would you say like starting a new colony that say you're not familiar with them and, and there's not a whole lot of information yet to start them kind of half and half and then just keep an eye on them and see yeah. where they're at? Yeah. I mean, probably the biggest challenge for me is where I live because my, my ambient humidity is like 30% here normally. Okay. And I found that sometimes, you know, I would find them dead on the dry side, even though they had plenty of moisture and seemingly enough humidity. You can adjust all that with ventilation changes too. But what I ultimately yeah. end up doing is I started getting so much is I humidify the room now. So I keep the room okay. at about 60% humidity. And then I have almost no issues with them dying on the dry side anymore. That's a cool idea. I, I can't really humidify the basement that I'm in, but um, I keep them, honestly, I keep them with less ventilation to try to keep that humidity in. Um, so they, they have ventilation, but not as much as like I'm seeing in your bins yeah. right now, you've got good ventilation. And then I, when you showed me the inside of the, the scarlet bin, um, I was like, Oh, maybe I need to up my ventilation. Cause now there's a new school on that. There's people that are keeping big names that are keeping successfully that no ventilation. They just have a lid on there and maybe a couple holes to, for oxygen exchange or whatever. I think uh, it depends on exchange. the species. Depends on the species. Sure. Sure. I mean, yeah, I guess it's possible to do it with just about anyone, but it would be hard to keep it set up, you know, keep it managed at that point. Um, so what do you think as far as you're keeping clowns too, clue guy? I mm -hmm. know that's one that I struggled with in the beginning. Um, I know a lot of people that have that story, like they bought a starter colony and it just died off. Um, and they're keeping other ice pods that are technically harder to keep but it's been an issue. So what is the, what is your trick? I think those? what I noticed with those when I was learning about them is cause I had, um, a vulgar and the Sodom first. Okay. Um, and they seem to like it like quite a high percentage of moisture and fairly high humidity. Yeah. I've noticed that the, the Kluge, I mean, they like to have a moist area and, fairly high humidity, but they also spend a lot more time in the drier areas I've noticed than like my Vulgar and Asadam do. I had that too when I finally kind of figured them out. I had a stack and it was just for aesthetic state sake. So I had a stack of larger pieces of uh, mm -hmm. charcoal, you know, the natural wood charcoal. And I just mm -hmm. stacked them up to make like, I don't know, a terrace kind of thing. It looked cool. And they were always on there. Um, so that's where I just started feeding them was on that because it had no mold, no issues with that yeah. on the on the carbon. Um, a, a Werner, I also like it the same way. Okay, okay. A, I think it's weird how armadillidium has such a, a range. Like there's half of them that like it, not half, but there's a good amount that like it dry and a ha yeah. another good amount that like it really wet. The zebras like a drier area too, at least in my experience. I hadn't tried that. That's probably why my zebra colony sucks Every, everybody has the issue with too many zebras and mine are never more than like middling like they they're keeping it alive but that's about it um i'll have to check that out that and they're like not my favorite so i want them to be you love yellow cool. zebras, though don't you mm. you gotta start with me huh you start with me already <laughs> I got a lot of good feedback on that episode. There's a lot of people on my side, I have to tell you. Um, I still want to find out the person that actually named them that or came up with the morph and got to name them and be like, why? Just to ask them. I just want to be like, why would you do that? Why would you not call them bubble bees? You're killing me. Um, such an opportunity. <laughs> just make up a name. Call them unicorns then. <laughs> I think they're beautiful. I think the yellow zebra is beautiful. Um if one understand, they basically breed the same, right? They're the same. Yeah. Prolific. Yeah. Do they go back? I heard there's something where they kind of revert. I I I I kind of combined my colonies as I was running out of space because I had okay. two different lines of them. And I'm seeing a lot more that are lighter. They're not as dark yellow in that ah. group. So it's very possible I'm going to have to re-isolate them. <laughs> oh, man. That's what—that's the last thing you want is like pastels or something. 
Unless you want to call right. them pastels. <laughs> that would make sense. That would make some sense. So you're saying the clue guy, the trick is to give them a more of a dry side. Yeah, an area that's okay. So differentiate between humidity and moisture, right? So yeah. a side that doesn't have moisture much in the substrate, but still has to have the humidity in order for them to breathe. Right, 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 right. So, and they'll get that uh, from the wet side, basically, right? It'll come through. It, it depends on your ventilation. That's true. That's true. That's why I started humidifying the whole room so that I didn't have that issue where the, the ambient air is always about 60, which seems okay. to be okay for them for at least a while. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're doing checks. How often are you doing checks on 250 bins? Well, I, my son and I share that responsibility. So I have my son doing a okay. lot of the basic maintenance. Um, we look in on them once every week to two weeks for the majority. Of course, okay. most of my experiments and things I'm looking in on almost daily just because I want to sure. see what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. You got a monitor. But what do you mean by experiments? What kind of stuff are you doing? Oh, like the, the auto fogging and the true fogging stuff that I've been working on. Yeah, I want to get into that a little bit later. That looked really <laughs> fascinating. So, yeah, uh, Eddie's one of the only people, or sorry, the only person that I know that's using a uh, fogger on his isopod bins. Yellow Zebra is very intuitive. No, no, it's not intuitive, Beetle Guy. <laughs> Deletes. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so then we get to Oskin or Scabers. I'm sorry, I wanted to talk about Scabers too. Like, there mm -hmm. was a million morphs, most of them have the same basic care right yeah they're all the same that's one of the things different between them and lavis like let some of the lavis can't breed with one another right? like dairy cows and, and yeah, dairy yeah cows and it's have... pretty obvious like if you get an adult dairy cow and set it next to an adult orange lavis yeah the dairy cows are like two to three times the size they're like oh huge and scapers are mostly the same size and they all will breed with one another and I have a, I have one I call a mega mix where I put like 15 morphs together. There's lots of cool stuff coming out of that. I think that's so wild how people get so lucky with that. Just such random selection. Um, so they're pretty easy to get going on a new morph if you're really. Oh, yeah. If you're into genetics and you want to experiment with that stuff, that's what I would work with. Skaver, because they're really prolific, too. I've got the only yeah. species I ever got was orange koi. Um and I still have them going. And I started to cull. I noticed a lot of like I'd get solid whites and solid oranges. And so I'd have to cull those out. Um, That's probably the most popular morph too. The orange koi? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got a really strong. Um, they have really great markings. I got them from Supreme Gecko, um, Wally Kern. And they are still to this day gorgeous. Like I still have to, you know, like I said, look through and pull out the guys that are solid or have reverted a little bit. Um, cause who wants that? If I wanted whites and oranges, I would just get whites and oranges. You know, I want those spots. I want that, uh, that differentiation. <laughs> I've run out of time to like do a lot of culling. So I've sure. started, I started sending people like twice as many and letting them call them on their own. <laughs> <laughs> so your 10 plus is like 30. Yeah. Uh, or 50 or something like that. Depends. <laughs> I think I'm putting an order in this week, Eddie. Uh, <laughs> let me PM you right now. Uh, yeah, and this with scavers, you kind of have to do that too. Like they're so prolific. They've got some weird yeah. names too. I can't get into their weird names. Um, and a lot of those are, you know, American breeders or uh, that gave them like I don't even know, like lemonades. Lemonades was one that I was like, I guess that's fair, but it looks more like yellow snow to me in in every sense. So. <laughs> Then lemonade. Um, but yeah, I think that that's so cool that you can just get a morph. Because I was seeing them for a long time. It seemed like everybody was working with scavers and it kind of fell off. I haven't seen anything really like new in a while. Um, but for a little bit, it seemed like every time you logged onto somebody's page, it was some new wild morph that they had that was not like anything you had really seen before. Is that just like, you think that's just a seasonal thing that just kind of. Um, no, I mean, I think people are still doing it, but again, too, with the super prolific, 
pods as you know the hobby's going to reach a curve of growth to a certain degree where all the super easy to breed ones everyone's going to have them already so then you're not going to see as many people like wanting them that's true that's true they're going to want that that's what i'm in i'm in that thing now where i want the next thing and by the time i get the next thing something else crazy is out and i need that like the spikies are an obsession of mine right now so i'm trying to learn everything i can about them um, and it doesn't really matter what from from the shiny gators up to what I call the hairbrush. I suppose <laughs> they just look like that hairbrush with legs. So I know there's probably a better name for them. Um, but that's what I would call it if I had the choice. So uh, but the scabers were still I'm jumping ahead. I'm jumping ahead. Um, the, what I forget how you said it, but the Oskinellis. Oniscus acellus. <laughs> Oniscus acellus. See, I just combined the two. Um, I haven't had any of those. Are, what are they more they're on par with? Like, what's the care for them? They're, they're easy? They're amazing. I love them. Well, yeah, I, I think they're pretty easy, but they, they do like it more moist and more humid than I think any of the other pods that I have. Those and um, Trachelopus, they all like it really, really moist. Okay. Okay. But there's some what was cool morphs with the Oniscus acellus too. I I feel like I saw ten come out at once, and then I haven't yeah. seen anything since. Like the witch's brew, I think, right? I recently got some um, orange Mardi Gras. Oh, I didn't know that was out. They're all orange, orange and white. They're orange and white. Okay, okay. So they come from uh, Jeremiah Tool in Canada. Okay, he isolated them. That's so excellent. I like that we can know who did it in the hobby. It's not that big of a thing where it's just yeah. some random. Um, you can track it back to the actual originator and get like, how did you do this? What was your recipe? Um, which is exactly what it is, is a recipe. So they like it more moist. I noticed in your one bin you had a lot of uh, the ground was covered with uh, uh, hides. Mm -hmm. Like you have a lot of hide area for them and a lot of I think that's good because it adds a lot of surface area for them to get around and, and decide how yep. humid they want it, how moist they want it. It does. Um, yeah, yeah. Are they? Is it pretty much like that with all of your bins where you give them that that much hide? Yeah, and I try to I try to make hides like span moist to dry areas too, so like it's different from one side to the other. Because yeah. I notice they'll like tend to bunch up in a certain area under the hide also. But sure. I started I started doing that because I just remembered when I was a kid and I was collecting them. Where did I always find them? Yeah, well, right. They're, that they're never out running around on the surface, heart, unless it's the middle of the night and it's like dewy or something. But they're always under something that's moist and damp and rotting. You know, even yeah. under pieces of plywood and stuff. That was my trap in uh, in my garden. Was I would set up when I was started out. I just started doing um, Volgari, and I wanted to see if there were any different genetics in my yard. So, you know what I mean? Like more high yellow or something with a pattern or whatever. Um, so I laid out bark in my garden, you know, in a big pile to see what would kind of congregate there. And my stepdad or my father-in-law came through to help uh, set my garden up and, and took my spot trap away. <laughs> oh, I put it in your bird pit. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the help, dad. Um, but yeah, you get to see that all the time. Red aficionalis. Wait, what? The aficionalis is like one of my favorite isopods. Red ones? I have orange crush. I haven't heard that there's red ones. They kind of look the same to me. I think they're just isolated in a different place. Okay. The reds and the oranges? Yeah. I thought the oranges were going to look completely different than they did when they got to me. So uh, the picture that I saw originally looked like a peeled grapefruit. Like it had that like almost translucence to it, but then you yeah. get them and they're like, oh, they're like brick red kind of, or like, mm -hmm. you know, terracotta more or less. Um, it, it wasn't what I expect. I still love them. I still love them, but it was not what I was expecting. They are my favorite slash least favorite pot because as soon as I open the bin, it's all just balls. All I see is balls. <laughs> <laughs> so it's easy to find where they are. Um, yeah. so, oh, they're all right here. Yeah. Yeah. The first time they did that, I freaked out. Like I was not ready for that. The little stridulation they do. 
Yeah. Um, but they are like my uh, my mascot or whatever for the show is an aficionalist. Like I, I've been obsessed with them since I got into isopods for no real reason other than they have that their little butt plate is like a straight drop off. There's no there's no rounded edge to it. It's just whoop. Um, that was the only thing that got it to me. Red aficionals are dope, definitely. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I got to find out about these red ones. But you're saying they're the same, just from a different group. Makes sense. I like that they're more, it's all the same thing. Like, they need all the same care. Um, speaking of big isopods, we'll get there next. So, Destroy is another species that is near and dear to me. Um, and they are... I've heard people have a hard time with them as well. I've had a lot of luck with them um, with no actual special care, just treated them like regular uh, vulgari. But um, is that the case? Do you find that to be the case? I think, yeah, I, I keep them like vulgari the Sodom. I think okay. that it's they're a little more touchy about blood and sex ratios. And luckily it's obvious on them when they're big enough. Yeah, do you mean like keeping the bloodlines mixed up? Yeah, and and like yeah. I said, in the sex ratios too. I I've the first couple of cultures I got once they grew, they were like really skewed one way or the other. So maybe there's something where they kind of naturally get skewed like that. That's possible. And I've talked to I lots wonder. of people that have that. Like you know, they'll have like either you know one or two males and ten females, or vice versa. That's wild. I hadn't heard that yet, but um, I did hear that they're seasonal breeders, so they're not, they're very slow to breed. I didn't find that once they no. were going, they just go like crazy. Okay. <laughs> okay. I knew mine took a long time to get going and now they're, they're pretty solid. I have a pretty good colony where I see them out all the time. Um, and I can't get over the size of them for an armadillidium. Like they're just tanks, but uh, as the adults, the adults, because you never get adults or see adults at a show. Um, you only see like the little peewees and you can't get a good sense of how big they're going to be. Um, so when you do see that adult, you're like, oh my God. Um, they're impressive. So you have not known them to be seasonal breeders. No, but I, I don't, and I don't know what that's all about. Cause I've had that with some of the other pods too, like the Spanish giants. Yeah. Like Hoffman Segi. Sure. Mine were breeding all year. Lately, they've slowed down a lot, but I think it's because I have to add new blood because I've had them for about okay. three years. But they've, over a couple of years, they produce like thousands like all year. Mine have been really prolific too, my uh, Hoffs. I didn't think they'd be that crazy. So I split them off into four colonies because I heard that they don't like overcrowding very much. Yeah, they don't um, like that. The males get kind of territorial. Yeah, and then the females and get really stressed out. Yeah, yeah, because they have that cool. They're on the list too, so we're going to talk about them here. Um, they have that cool uh, behavior where the females kind of guard the babies for a little while. Yeah, and, and that's it, fun to watch. In fact, that just reminded me. My very first pods that I kept were Hoffman Segi, and I got them from Wally. Yeah, that's where I got mine too. Like so, three years um, ago. And he sent me, we had another mascot for the show, Mr. Yucky. Um, he sent me an adult male with my like extra so I could see how big they would get. Do you know what I mean? He sent me like one of his bigger ones. Um, and I, I opened it up and he's on top. And I was like, holy cow. <laughs> I didn't realize it was just that one. So when I got him out and put him on my finger, I like how they don't like to be held at first, but as soon as you get them in your hand, they're just totally chill. They're totally fine with it. They just hang out. They don't try to run away. Um, so I got him out, and I didn't know they did that either. I was prepared for him to try to bolt. And uh, I asked my daughter, who was two, I think, at the time. She was like two, two and a half. I'm like, you want to hold this? She's like, no. <laughs> she got real close. She's like, that's Mr. Yucky. <laughs> so <laughs> Mr. Yucky died like two weeks later. I think he died of old age. But um, I was very sad. It was very sad. But they are they are one of my favorites, the Titans. Um, that's an app name for them. Are, are they the biggest? Porcelio? 
could be and Magnificus is really huge too. That's one that I haven't gotten that I've I, I had wanted uh, when I first got into the hobby because everything orange. I was into everything orange. Um, but I think they're really cool. So that okay, so Magnificus, I didn't realize they were that big. I thought they were like a big Lavis. No, they're big. They're that. about the same as Hoffs. Okay, okay. Um, is there any? Do you have any tips for Hoffs? Um, just I keep them a really reduced moist area. I still keep the humidity the same, but they have a, a lot of dry area. Okay, okay. So like one corner basically is what you're keeping. Yeah, like side. probably, I would say ten to twenty percent is moist of the substrate. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I have one. Uh, the all of my bins have one little corner, basically, like a tenth of the enclosure. I guess. Yeah, you're saying like ten percent of the moss and then substrate under it. Then whatever leaks out, mm -hmm. leaks out. But they've got a lot of rock and stuff for them too to climb on. Um, and then I keep the uh, the only other wet spot that they have is where I put the wet leaves. Um, I've been soaking leaves to to feed now too. So that they kind of are already a little more broken down than the dried leaves. I've seen some success with that. Um, I saw a little boost in numbers from the colonies that I've given that to, which is everything that I've left to my 15 to 20 colonies that I've left. Um, and nothing else. Do you, are they more high protein? Do you find or I don't? They don't seem to be super high protein eaters for me. Okay. I mean, they okay. do, they eat it, but not like some of the colonies do. I had heard recently that it's kind of like what they have to eat, they go with. Not not just hops, but isopods in general. So if they only have protein around, they're going to go for protein. If they only have veg, they're going to go for veg. Um, they, they do have preferences, though, I, I've noticed. And they, uh, especially the ones that can be like super prolific, the more proteins they're given, the more prolific they're going to be. Okay, that makes sense. So the big breeders using a lot of the protein. That makes mm -hmm. sense. That makes sense. I hadn't thought of that. Okay. Everybody so, probably knows my my preferences is uh, freeze-dried peas and dried minnows. <laughs> that seems Our, to be a real big pods, one for a lot. My pod's preferences. Because I, I, once I started using those two, I could try every fresh fruit or vegetable or whatever under the sun. And they won't, if they have those peas and minnows, they don't eat the other stuff. <laughs> they don't care, just rots. It just sits there and rots. Oh, yep. God. So that's the way to go. I, I imagine you just have buckets of freeze dried peas and minnows. Yeah, the freeze dried peas are the problem because of the preppers, those bastards. <laughs> they cost like 10 or 15 bucks a pound. I'm not going to lie. I've got like 60 pounds of uh, ready to eat, you know, food, emergency food over here <laughs> under the stairs. So your wife got, ain't that much for those damn peas. <laughs> <laughs> There's no peas. I hate peas. There's no peas in there. I've tried, I've tried all kinds of other things. Of course, they can't eat the regular dried peas. They're too hard. I've tried like right. powdered pea protein, which kind of works. But I just keep breaking down and buying the freeze-dried peas because they like them so much. I mean, uh, it is wild that they're so expensive. You wouldn't think that that would be a thing that would cost so much money in our day and age, you know? Yeah. Um, freeze-dried peas who knew yeah I, I am not responsible for any of that cost i hate peas um that is not my thing at all i just learned to tolerate them in a pot pie because i got so tired of just picking them out all the time it's like let's just eat this. it's already in here it tastes like this let's just eat it um so i'm learning oh rick's here from Ophi spider verse what's up rick um do you powder them do you powder the peas or you just give them to them the whole Freeze dried so pea depends on the pods. I've I you can when you get the real good freeze dried ones, you can just pinch them and they powder. So I, I usually try okay. to pinch them, except for the like super you know the colonies where there's like five thousand of them in the bin because they don't care. Yeah. They'll eat them without them being pinched. <laughs> I just want to see a dairy cow rolling one away like a dung beetle, kind of. You know, like. I've had I've had my um, Sevilla yeah. fight over minnows. Like literally there'll be two or three of them like tug of warring, trying to take them away. <laughs> that was my favorite thing doing the minnows for the first time was watching the Hoff, watching a Hoff drag off a whole minnow 
by itself with like two other pods just riding. Yeah. Um, that was my favorite thing. I got real shy with them though for the the minnows because I had to find a higher quality. I had a um a bacterial outbreak. So mm-hmm. it got this like red slime on it and I lost my milk bags. I lost like 99% of my milk bags. I had five left um, that I salvaged. Right. Like the, the bodies were red. That's how I knew the bacteria was the thing that did it. Um, so the mm-hmm. five that I got out, I don't know how they escaped or didn't eat it. Um, but they turned back into a real, like a whole colony after that. But, um, and then someone was nice enough to send me like a dozen to help out. So um it was it was pretty crazy, but that was from the um, the minnows. And it had to happen with three different brands because when I feed them now, I keep an eye on them, um, and I've seen them go. And I try to feed on the right on the dry side. You know, I put all my freeze dried stuff or dried yeah stuff in the in the dry side, so we don't really get that moisture in there. Um, but that's just I, that was my experience. I got gun shy with them. I still use them, but I'm very like okay let's keep an eye on this bin because they just got minnows whereas everybody else just shows off their pile of fish skeletons in the one corner of their guest setup so which is a little morbid i thought they would eat the skeletons straight down for the calcium but they will eventually yeah it's just funny to see those you know someone opens their bin and there's like 10 little skeletons there like a like a little fish graveyard it's just funny to see um, clearly they're getting their calcium somewhere else, you know? Um, so that's Hoffs. That's Bolivari. Uh, I know they're a little more difficult to keep than some of the yeah. other Porcelio. So what are your tips for something like a Bolivari or would you say like Ornatus is on the same level kind as of. Bolivari? Kind of. They're a little bit different, I think though. Sure. Sure. I, um, one of the things that I, I love about keeping isopods is that it's, it's so new and they're like, there's so much to learn about them and, and it's challenging because it's really difficult to find out where they were actually collected. Yes. Um, I suspect that Bolivari are real cave dwellers and I don't think there's many other pods I've seen that are. And I'll tell okay. you why I think that because I initially started trying to keep them just like all the other giant Spanish ones. Um, and they did kind of okay, but I started noticing on the sides of the bins that all the little babies were burrowing right on the cusp where it goes from moist to dry. So I started paying more attention to moisture. And and ultimately what I found out was that I put a bunch of like egg crate pieces and I partially put moisture on those pieces so that there's a lot of micro gradients and they almost all started going up under those and not hardly using the bark anymore. And like getting in the places where there was like a kind of a transition from moist to dry. And after I did that, I mean, for the next couple of years, even up until now, I, they literally, there's almost too many in the bin. That's a great problem to have. That I think that's one of the most beautiful isopods that we have. Oh, the I Bolivari. do too. I just love that, that color. I love their shape. That was the other thing that made me think they were cave dwellers is the coloration. Because, you know, when we say like people have said like duckies come out of caves, I'm like, I don't think so. They don't like, cause if you think of any nature documents you've ever watched of cave dwelling animals, the further you go into the cave, the more color they lose. Like, yeah, the pigments are pigmented challenged. There, no color. Yeah. <laughs> and Bolivari don't have a ton of color, just a bit of yellow, you know? Yeah. And somehow it shows up so well. I haven't seen them in person. I need to see Bolivari like face to face. Cause I, oh, I feel like they have that translucency. Yeah. So like the yellow <laughs> comes out from underneath. How they move is amazing. They like, when I'm trying to like package them yeah, <laughs> and I take them off of the hides, they'll like run as fast as any pod you've ever seen. And then they stop and like, won't move. <laughs> and then if you tap them and disturb them a little bit again, super fast for a little while, stop. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah, they, do they have like the long legs? I just saw something. Um, uh, who was it? Pisa Villa. I think they had kind of long legs. They stood up almost on stilts basically. They don't seem to do that so much. They stay pretty flat, but man, are they fast when they move. That's so funny to think that that's like a fast isopod. You wouldn't think it. You yeah. would think they're like the spatulatus where they're like limpets. They just suck down onto the the rock or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's an unusual. I hadn't heard that about them at all. That's really funny. 
uh, you have big eyes or are blind. Oh, we're talking about the guys in the uh, in the caves. I think that's great. So what would be there, the cave dwellers, you're using the microgradients with the, are they, are you still keeping them with the egg crate or are you trying anything yeah. else like limestone or? I, I honestly, I've tried limestone on tons of, of pods. The only ones I found that seem to like really, really benefit from it are orange tigers from Surat Thani. And okay. I also talked to some people that know the person that collected the originals, and they said they actually collected them on limestone. Okay, there you go. Um, I love to hear those stories where it's like, where did this come from? Where did this actually yeah. come from? Because I want to hear the stories of the collectors, like the guys that are in a village somewhere in Thailand, and they're like, wait, Americans it's, want what now? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to find out because for a lot of those people in those countries – I mean, that's their family's livelihood. You know, they don't want to share where they got them from. Although lately I've had a lot of people from Vietnam asking me husbandry questions on Facebook for some reason. Huh. They're probably starting like farms or something. I, I think they are. They're, are they're just collecting them and trying to keep them alive so they can ship them? That's true too. Yeah. I don't know why they wouldn't just start farms like the beta keepers out there. They have like you know what I mean? Beta Splendens, uh, yeah. Fish Keepers, uh, out in those areas where it's just tropical. They just have thousands and thousands. Like, why not do that and save I, time I'm, and I'm sure it's coming. Yeah. Just because yeah. it's growing in popularity in the whole world, you know? I think it's coming. It is. You, you see people, we have keepers from all over the world uh, in just my little isopod group. Um, and it's wild to see they have cooler stuff usually than we do or have some access to some cooler stuff, <laughs> but we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, yeah, I think Bolivari are one of the Bolivari and the, um, I'm saying that right, right. The expanses. Is that the one I'm thinking of? Expanses. They have the high orange. That's the one that has a high there orange. Is a, there is a high orange one. Okay. There's autumnal equinox and then the regular white ones. The equinox. And then, uh, uh, Oren's got one. I forget what he's calling it. I think he's, I don't remember, but I know Oren's got a new one too. Oh, uh, Expanses Morph? Mm-hmm. That guy's always got something going on. He's got the craziest setups too. He's, he's got like, like he's the OG pod keeper. <laughs> well, seeing his, like, so he was walking around his basement, which I guess he has a lot of his stuff down there um, before we went live and uh, he was getting settled into, he literally sat on his basement floor to film the whole thing so seeing the stuff in the background it was like oh you know like tables made out of two by fours and just very rustic like get the job done kind of stuff which was great and then the setup on it you knew was immaculate and fantastic so it was it was neat to see that it wasn't some big steel amazing laboratory style setup it was just like oh i'm a keeper i'm keeping these things appropriately but here i love to see everybody's setups like yours in the back with the metal shelf units like that's handy and excellent it looks good too you know um now with who did we have next to cover oh yeah the marinella these guys are like one of the most popular things in the hobby right now they're they're one of the hot this is the hot species to have in the hobby right now i feel like after spikies spikies are the one everybody wants but the colors on these guys is just insane and you've got a few right you've got at least a few of these guys don't you oh marilinella yeah yeah probably about a dozen species okay and that's about all there is right now isn't it yeah yeah so, and you were showing me some pictures of yours, and I, I can't get over, A, the names on these are amazing. The naming, whoever named all of these, <laughs> keep letting that guy name my spots, because he's crushing it. Um, yeah. No notes, no notes, perfect job. Um, <laughs> but <coughs> I was on uh, a short list to get the the tricolors in, uh, in America, like a couple of years ago when they first were mm -hmm. coming in. And for whatever reason, that guy disappeared. Like I was ready to cut a check and he just vanished. So I don't know what happened with that. I was like, oh, 
I had the money. I had the opportunity. Could have been on the ground floor. Um, so that was a missed opportunity that I regret to this day because the tricolor is still my favorite. Um, do they all have pretty much the same care requirements? So far, so far for the most part, yes. And now I've heard mixed stories on their prolificality, <laughs> prolificness. Um, I've heard that they're almost hard to keep control of. And then I've heard that they're quite difficult to breed. I, I mean, quite honestly, I think it's, I was in, I was in the herp world for a really long time, years and years ago. Sure. And I, I, I see something very similar. I think that because they're new and, you know, before recently, the very vast majority of them were all Asian imports that were what I call quick flipped. Sure, because sure. they don't want to deal with the deaths and, you know, things die when you ship them that far, you know? Yeah, for and, sure. And then also because of the cost, they're, you know, really expensive. So people are only buying five or six of them instead of buying 50, right? So right, where you want to start a colony, yeah. Odds like so much lower. Because um, <coughs> I'm seeing with almost all of them, because that's what I, that friend of mine and I started doing was we were starting colonies, you know, with like 50 to 100 knowing that we were going to lose a good majority of them. And once they've all started going so far, all of them don't seem all that difficult. I mean, I think they're a bit of a challenge because they really do seem to need both high ventilation and high humidity, which for some people, that's a real challenge to provide both of those things. Um, but I just, I'm just hoping. And one of the reasons I've been trying to get more of them out there now is I just, I want, people to not be shying away and being afraid of them because I don't, I think now we're at that point where there's going to start being enough of them that are captive born and bred that it's going to get easier. Yeah. I'm excited to see. It seems like almost every species people are having great um, success with captive breeding. And I'm excited to see that like more in this hobby than just about any other hobby. There's been so much success with captive breeding um, that I'm excited to see where that takes isopods so uh it's pretty interesting to see that and it'll totally outweigh imports in a, in a pretty short amount of time i feel like yeah it will with some of them like the the ember bees which i think not enough people have seen those in person yet because to me they're like probably the most amazing one they Just are gorgeous they're freaking they huge they're gigantic they oh yeah they're like four to six times larger than tricolors they're gigantic <laughs> I never thought that. I never yeah. thought that. And they, I'm noticing these um, red ember bees that came from Vietnam. I'm looking at them now and their, their broods are like 20 to 50. They're having like huge broods. Oh, that's a problem. That's uh, good to have. Yeah. Right. Especially on so, something like that. Holy cow. And they're so like super active on the surface. It, they're just, they're amazing. That's what I like about seeing them. Whenever anybody videos, they uh, we see them on YouTube or whatever. They're Merlinella. They are always out. They're mm -hmm. always doing something. You can still flip a cork and see like thirty, but you can see them moving. When you were showing off your bin of the Scarlets, there were some moving around, you know, doing their thing out in the open, um, and they didn't seem super shy. So that's a species that I like. That's a trait that I like, and that I've kept that's caused me to keep the species that I have is that they're more out and about minus my aficionados. <laughs> so <laughs> who pretend to be rocks. <laughs> I still love them. Um, I still want to get a marble thing to try to have races with them, but um, I haven't done that yet. So a <laughs> little marble run for the aficionados. <laughs> kidding, kidding. Um, yeah, the Merlinella, so they you want high ventilation and high humidity, so like a mountain type of a climate? Um, I don't know if necessarily mountain, but I just noticed that they did way better when I really ramped up the ventilation and, and kept the humidity high also. That's excellent. What kind of, uh, are you doing separate bins or are you doing like, I'm going to do this for two months and then I'm going to do this for two months? Um, I, just... I've generally just chosen a group and, and done experiments to see what works. Yeah, yeah. So you're kind of split off a little colony to see, okay, these guys are going to get high humidity and high ventilation. Yeah. These guys are going to get high humidity and moderate ventilation. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. That makes sense. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to have too. 
Um, what do they want to see here? Red embers. Oh, Chris H has red embers from you. You're getting a lot of uh, a lot of love here. I haven't watched the uh, the comments very much, but they are going hard and heavy on these comments. Um. So ember bees, I didn't realize they'd be that big. So what size are you talking like compared to other isopods? Like where are they at? Um, like that's bigger than a vulgari. You're talking about bigger than an average vulgari. Here, I'll, I'll, I'm going to set my phone down for a minute, and I'll just show okay. you. I'm down for that. I think I think an aficionados marble run would be kind of funny. Um, I don't know of one small enough. I might have to get out my router, see what we can do. Use that as the opening video. Problems with expanses and magnificus, numbers just not growing. I have to apologize too, Eddie. You're gonna start getting a lot of YouTube commercials for StreamYard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna I'm just gonna apologize to anyone who's ever been on the show. Oh, they're so pretty. Well, let me see if I can find there's a surviving minnow. Okay, yeah, there's really a, got this, a lot it, of these guys. It won't um my camera unfortunately won't macro on this website. Yeah. But I mean, I look, at, look at that big one in the middle just sitting there. Just juvenile. You know, and that one, that over. bigger one's probably an inch long, if not a little more. An inch. Holy yeah. cow. All right. So that's easily like a fingernail. Yeah. Oh, so that guy's a monster too then. Yeah. Some of these guys are just gorgeous. These are like my favorite right now. I mean, I I have to say, Ember Bees, uh, I hadn't seen them really until right before I talked to you. And they're they're up there for me as far as like just gorgeous isopods. Oh, Justin hasn't seen a single ad all week from StreamYard. So you don't hate Dana yet? All right, these are the Scarlets, right? This is the Scarlet. Yeah, I, I just moved them from a 19 to this 44. Okay. Uh, to go into that auto-fogging auto rack. I'm also starting to use a lot more like live moss because they seem to like it. And so I'm I see your high them. ventilation. I see you've got really good cross-ventilation yeah. on this too. Like a lot. And there's right, some yeah. kind of humidifier going like crazy. Or your isopods <laughs> are vaping. Okay. <laughs> and then if you see that, there's a grommet with a hole in it yep. on the back of the bin. So the, I just finished this auto-fogging rack and all the testing and just started moving stuff into it. So if you look kind of in the back, you'll see a nozzle. Yeah, definitely. I made these so they like slide in like drawers. And then I used like a Mist King pump and system but i'm using some different nozzles because i don't like their nozzles they're not fine enough of a spray okay um, it's all automatic now it, it um fogs them seven seconds three times a day wow i mean guys i don't know if you're seeing but here's the thing like that's a great thing to do for your pods that you've made such an investment in like that's that ember bee colony is thriving. When you lifted the, the cork and all those juveniles and manca started just scattering like crows, that's <laughs> an amazing sight to see. That's exciting for anyone's ice pods, but for an ice pod of that caliber to be that. Oh, yeah, look at them getting misted. And then these up here, something I'm doing with actual fog, it's not a mist. Okay. These are like reptile foggers. And this is where I'm keeping all the long spikies right now. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So they're more arboreal? They seem to be. They're all over the place up high in the in the enclosures. 
Now these guys are generally pretty small, right? They're they're pretty small ice pods. Yes. Yeah, I don't even think I could get them on the camera to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I we had that problem before with the um well, I called them the dream sickles, but the the orange and white, they almost look like a spiky panda like that razorback kind of a I don't know what species that is at all. Um there's too many now. I can't even say Ocellio, Othello, Oscanellus. I can't even <laughs> Clearly, I can't say it. Um, I don't try that hard, I'll be honest. Yeah, everybody's loving that setup. But I think if you're going to have ice pods on that level and try to do it at that level of excellence, like that's something that's really cool. That could be a new innovation for pod keepers. Like to have the flogger, to have the mist system. I've never seen anything like that so far talking to anybody where people would set up a dedicated mist system for their isopods. My, my friend will talk me into doing it because he did it earlier. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll see. I haven't talked to Will. So <laughs> <laughs> that's smart. So when you're starting a colony, are you trying to start with like 50 to a hundred? Is that what you're? It, it depends colony? on what they are. I mean, if I know that they're going to be, you know, likely wild caught imported animals, then yes. Okay. Yeah, because you're going to have that die-off. You're going to want to do that, accommodate yeah. that die-off. I, I mean, I don't like to start with less than 10 just because of the issues that could be with, like, sex ratios or just a few dying off from shipping, you know? Sure, sure. So no less than 10 and ideally 20 to 30 when they're captive bred ones. Okay. that gives you. I feel like that gives you a real good mix um, and a real good chance. And especially when you're getting 10 to 30 or 20 to 30 uh, shipped in, You've got mm -hmm. at least one or two that are already, you know, gravid. So <laughs> yeah. you're probably looking at having babies in the first couple of weeks. That's what made me think I was a great breeder is when I would see babies pop up in a bin. Like I'd yeah. get 50 and then a week later I'd have babies. I'm like, I'm crushing it. No, that's I just the, kept them alive the for reason, a week. That's the other reason I like sending out like larger counts. I like it when people are happy. I just like sharing pods with people. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people in the comments are having stories about that. Like, I got this from him. I got this from him. Now everybody wants to do a marble run. So <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get out my router. I'll be having my router out this week to do some woodwork. So uh, I'll see if I can get up a, a marble run situation for them. All the little toy ones I found are too big. Like they're too big to put an isopod through. It'd be like a toddler on a, on a you know, a full sized uh, water slide. Right? Yeah, right. You don't want that necessarily. It's probably a little stressful. Probably a little stressful. But um yeah, I don't think they would even notice the aficionados just stay there. So um uh, I'm gonna get to my most challenging ice pod that I've heard of. I'd, I've never kept them, but that's why, because I've heard from everyone that they're difficult. We did get to talk to Ben Quintanas, who found them apparently. Um the lemon blue slash Jupiters. Mm -hmm. I know from him that they're found within a mile of each other. So I kind of keep them together in my head. They're not the same species, but they're close enough that their, their husbandry, I think would be exactly the same. So what have you had success with them? Either um, of them? Yeah, they both breed for me, but rather slowly. I mean, I don't know if it's just cause I'm used to these other ones that are super prolific. Uh, the challenge I'm, finding is getting them to keep their color their bright colors like they seem to lose that over time and there's I've lots of different too. theories about it and i just haven't figured it out yet i think it's got to be something they're getting in their local diet um, maybe but if that's the case then how are captive bred ones starting with it and then losing it later what's your yeah. theory what theory do you subscribe to on how they I, lose their color i mean i do think it's probably diet based but trying to find what that is, like um, a friend of mine does have some connections in Asia and he did get some leaves from over there. Okay. Uh, that I think he said seemed to help to a certain degree, but I literally haven't talked to anybody that's found what is a hundred percent works perfectly. So sure. I'm not, I'm, I'm still, that's still one that I'm trying to learn. It'll probably be years before you find out what that is or, Someone will just be like, oh, I give them bug burger with Kool-Aid in it, and they're beautiful. You know what I mean? Like, someone will have was, some weird... Was, my first joke was, what, has anyone tried food coloring? 
<laughs> just put a little bloop, just drop it out. Yeah. No, they look good, They're right? Like, number, number five yellow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the trick is getting the yellow on the rim and the purple on top, you know? Yeah. I think they're one of the most outstandingly like pretty isopods. And oh, they are that pretty good. Just to, I thought it was a morph at first. I didn't know it was that's what they look like in the wild. So to know that they have that in another country and we have like Nasadum, like <laughs> like America gets Nasadum. Like who cares? Who cares about like they're cool, but we get these like brown to gray isopods with maybe some yellow spotting on them or some different shades of gray, like modeling. And then you get like Jupiter's and, you know, any of their Merlinella. There's no turd brown Merlinella. There's plenty of like, pardon me, but like garbage colored Cubaris that are like named, you know, Cloud Love or Dream. Dream is actually kind of a good looking pod. Um, but I saw one the other day, we we talked about it on the show. I don't even know what the actual like common name that they use is, but we renamed it like Aquarium Gravel because that's <laughs> that's what it looks like. <laughs> but it's like a $400 or something or $150 for six isopod. It's like, why? Why would you buy that? I, I love them all. Like They all have really cool things. Like Hilaria Brevacornis is one of my favorite pods. And they're like totally cryptic. Like unless you dig them up, you'll almost never see one. And I've like, never seen one in person. Yeah, they're brown. Yep, <laughs> but they're monsters, right? They're huge. Oh yeah, they? they're huge. They're like a big marble. Do they fully um, ball up? I can't yeah. remember the name of that, but yeah, they make they conglobate. Conglobate. That's it. All right. My brain was saying subjugate, and I was like, maybe they do underground, but uh. <laughs> and they're like little bulldozers. They're just they they move really weird, and I don't know. They're just cool. <laughs> Do they just kind of dig their way? I see them kind of digging their way yeah. instead of bulldozing through. I don't, okay. they're the only ones I never worry about like squishing them when I put the hides down because <laughs> they'll just dig their way out. And they're, um, they're the, they're the single species in their genus. So it makes them really unique. That's really cool. Uh, what's my drink for today? My drink for today is uh, Sprecher's root beer. So Sprecher's, if you're listening, uh, we're still looking for that sponsorship money. So uh, give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> numbers in the description it won't be um i love the hilarious brevicornis that was one of the species i was dead set on buying uh the isopod chick was the only one i knew that had them breaking over there um mm -hmm. was the only one i knew that had them she still to this day has species that i don't see anyone else with um i had a i can't even remember the name of it it was like troglodylus um troglodylus rotundatus green spot it wasn't green spots they looked like they had the same markings as the clue guy the clowns oh but it was like a porcelio shape or a pruinosis shape they were a little bit bigger than a pruinosis um, but they had that kind of shape to them and they were supposedly a cave species um probably like just inside of a cave but they had clown markings on they had the yellow dots down the back and they had an orange skirt um and like a light brown to maroon body like their back um my colony lasted like two years, and then I don't know what I did, but they they all just crashed. Um, so and that was I took a, as good a care of them as I could because I thought they were amazing. And again, I had never seen them before. Um, she had the isopods that I have ant colonies. She had the isopods that are uh, known to be symbiotic with uh, ants. So like my ants are down with springtails, but they try to harvest and eat the isopods that i put in there so <laughs> once in a while i replenish their bulgari but um yeah that's about it they're like mobile snacks now so um but the, i did have those isopods in with these guys and i don't know if they just weren't getting what they needed or what but they disappeared so they basically look like dwarf whites i don't know how you would tell the difference devil's rice but, yeah they could she could have sold me devil's rice and i would have never known um because they were a little pricey and she hardly ever has them. But um, that's what I think is great about isopods is you have so much diversity as well with mm -hmm. these guys. Um, can't, can't collect them all. You can't. I know you have tried, sir. It seems like you have really <laughs> tried. I'm trying. <laughs> if you can't do it, I don't see how anyone can. Now, how long have you been in the hobby? Um, 
three or four years, maybe. See, and that's like you're a veteran at three to four years in this hobby now. I tend to be a little bit obsessive. That's fair. I think that's most isopod keepers. We kind of covered that. Uh, we did some stereotypes last week episode, and the isopod person is kind of obsessive, like that Pokemon player. Um, likes to sit in the corner with a hoodie, you know, with a good book and a bin of isopods to just look at. And then on the internet, total extrovert. But in person, <laughs> like, ah, I'm just going to cancel these plans. I'm not comfortable with more That's than That's me. People. I have like, I have zero social life. I'm surprised I did, I did this. <laughs> Checked it off. Well, I, definitely. I appreciate you coming on. I hope you're having a good time so far. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. Um, any experience with U.S. natives? Beetle guy, I think U.S. native ice pods are some of the most, I think they're some of the most boring ice pods that we have. But I love my Volgari high yellow bin. No, they're great. Um, Look at the variation in Volgare. Like, it's like Skaber. There's just so many different ones. You from, can do all the oh, from morphs you can get. You want. So many morphs. Yeah, there's so many. That's true. That's true. There are some really cool ones. I think I'm. You know, I think there's still a lot that we don't even really keep or know about too you know i just got oh, I bet. tylos from carlos the other, like not too long ago they're amazing they look a lot like miniature hilaria brevicornis it's tylos is the name of it that's their genus see there's even genuses i don't even know about see hilaria brevicornis do they come up for food um very rarely that but then again i keep them like their substrates like almost all rotwood so they don't, I don't think okay. they really need to come out. Yeah, that would be one I think the substrate is like, you got to get I, it. I, I keep, right. they process substrate like millipedes do. So that's kind of the trick I okay. found with them. Keep them a lot like millipedes. No cocoa, so, coir, or anything like that. Just almost all rotwood, um, a little bit of worm castings and stuff like that. And then I keep their whole okay. um, bin covered with like bark flats. Okay. Because they build little burrows underneath the bark. And then to kind of keep that moisture in too as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you want to keep that pretty constant. Yep. I think they're just cool. I, like I said, that was one of my favorite when I started. And I still haven't seen like a, um, I feel like more sites need to have a, a, like a size comparison or something to compare it to next to the picture. Either a ruler, um, I think smug bug. I, I'll send you some pics. I have pics of big ones like sitting on my finger. Okay. So you can see the size. And when you want some, let me know, because I have hundreds of them. Oh, God. They're like my pet pods. I don't really sell them much, but I like them. <laughs> I have some cool setups to see burrowing ice pods more, to see them more often. And they have seemed to be not bad for the ice pods. So <laughs> they're still breeding. They're still eating. They're doing great. My rubber duckies and my destroy are in those setups now. Kind of like a jar. A ant farm or something. It's a big jar. It's like a two gallon jar with a smaller jar on the inside. So and then yeah. the substrates in the, in the interim. So they have, oh. and then I have plants and coming out of the jar in the middle, like bamboo is what I, it died off, but I had bamboo in the one. Um, and so the duckies did really well in there. I think I gave away too many of my duckies. I think I crashed my colony that way. I just were giving them out. Um, but the destroyer doing really, really well in there. I'm just keeping the ducky bin going to see if they rebound. I know there's some in there. I just, they're very few, I think now. Um, but I think they might benefit or they, I would benefit from being able to see them instead of having to dig around in there to find them. You know what I mean? No, does that sound like a bad idea? Am I breaking I, up? No, I can hear you. Okay, okay. I was thinking it's, about if Hilaria could work in something like an ant farm. <laughs> oh, like now I for Venezuela Parvis, I tried. I had it. It was a worm farm actually. It's about this tall and about this wide and about this long, and they lived in there for a while, but keeping up with the moisture in that was so hard um i kept waiting to see my indicator was springtails wherever the springtails were like if they were down in the bottom i was 
not doing well, I needed to add. And then if they were at the top, basically hanging out all over, then I was doing well. But it was really hard to keep moisture in that setup because it would evaporate so fast. Um, I don't know. Having done a bunch of different things for ant farms, you'd have to do something for the brevicornis, I think, especially with the size of them, you'd have to do something special. But I'm going to brainstorm and then I might contact you to get some to see if I can make it work and then get back to you. I'm always trying new things with the husbandry to try to get to see these animals more and to appreciate them a little bit more. Um, Because I think that would help the hobby too. But all of us exotics keepers are okay with keeping a bin of dirt as a pet, I feel like. Like, oh, I've got tarantulas. Where are they? Uh, Somewhere. Oh, I've got millipedes. Where are they? Uh, I swear they're in there. You'll have to look, you know, I hope that you see one. Um, And I think brevicorn is probably around the same thing, right? Yeah. Do they ever come up to surface? Rarely. Rarely, so once in a while. So you kind of have to dig around to see how they're doing. Yeah, just lift up hides and there's tons of them under it. Oh, okay. So they do come up under the hide. Yeah, they build little burrows right underneath the hide. That's super cool. That See, that would be ant farmy. Um, I wonder if they would have the red light sensitivity. Don't With know. ants, you can put a red film down, and they can't see the light through that, so they're comfortable with the, under the red film. I don't know. Anyway, I'm brainstorming. We're off on a total tangent, as usual. I'm trying to like figure out Brevicornis before I even have them. Um, <laughs> I'll get this nailed down before we're out of this episode. So what, in your opinion... This is in your keeping with three years experience, three or four years, 250 bins, 100 and some species, 180 species or something, I think you said. Mm-hmm. What's the biggest challenge that you've had? What what species is the biggest challenge for you right now? Mm. I, th- I think probably the long spikies. Just because, I mean, I'm able to, I seem to be able to keep them alive really well, but I just don't, except for the ivories, like the ivories, I think there's a ton of babies in there now, but the other ones just don't seem to take off. So I can't quite figure out what it is that's causing that. So I'm happy the ivories are doing well. Yeah, it looks like you're keeping them all the same, more or less. So that's weird Mm -hmm. that they must be from different areas. And over, over the years, I've had trouble with, like, expanses has been tough for me, and I know they go really well for other people. I'm kind of starting to think as I'm moving through learning more, because I'm moving from the fogging to learning more about substrates and foods. Okay. Um, I'm feeling like the really well-rotted wood that you can, like, crumble with your hands is, like, really important for a lot of them. I'm pretty sure that's a staple. That should be a staple now in everybody's substrate mix. And At least I, well, I'm, I'm not I'm not using it in substrate anymore. I'm using it as top dressing underneath the decaying leaves. Okay, so you've got your leaves, well, your cork, your leaves, the wood, and then substrate. Yeah, essentially, and moss in there somewhere. Yeah, I'm, and I did that mostly because I'm noticing that. I mean, there's some species that seem to burrow to some degree, but most of them don't really burrow a ton. Okay. Okay. So I figured I figured and when I used when I was young and was hunting isopods, that's where I always found them. I didn't find them like buried. I always found them in between like where the the humus or the underneath the rotting log or piece of wood or whatever. That's where I always found them. So I'm kind of trying that using it as more of a top dressing rather than a substrate ingredient. That makes sense. I just imagine like a strata layer in the bins now. Mhm. Like you're saying, like you almost see like a layer cake. That's what I'm doing. That's really smart. I hope everybody's listening and taking that note because that sounds really good Um, to set that up in that sense. Because like you said, a lot of them, the only ones I see burrowing are manka, usually Mm -hmm. manka. Um, They'll burrow, but that's more for safety than anything else. Like they're not, I think that's more to keep them safe or give them a sense of uh, security. Um, I don't know for sure. Like, don't quote well, me. I'm not the and, guy. And I'm not putting like chunks. I'm I'm running the rotwood through a mulcher. Okay. Okay. So you know what I mean? It's yeah. Small, 
bits and I'm just kind of using that and putting a layer of it on top of the substrate. And I think that's great. Okay. So you're running it pretty small then not fine, mm -hmm. but no, just like, you know, like grain of sand to quarter inch pieces, kind of varying. Okay. And I put that in there. I kind of just grind mine up. Like I break it up and then grind my hands. I don't have a mulcher. But um, <laughs> I got the mulcher, so I didn't have to do that in 250 bins. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not at your level. So uh, for my couple bins, it's pretty solid. Uh, I feel like when I start to get into uh, millipedes again, I might go go hard on some kind of a a mixer or like buy a junky food processor or something small scale for me. Um, best substrate mix. That is a loaded question. Uh, and Sandy, we've got some substrate episodes you can go back to for that. That's a whole other episode. Substrate is probably five episodes. Oh, I will mention something. Cause I've been talking to a lot of people that are making substrate and, you know, selling it and things. Sure. And I, I think we need to put some focus and some learning on pH also on the I think pH. It's 100%, of the right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's 100% a factor, um, especially for these crustaceans, because that's going to be something that you need. Uh, I think Kyle put something in his substrate specifically as a yeah, buffer. Yeah, Kyle and I have been talking a lot about that, about the pH. Yeah, okay, okay, good. He's so open to uh, new ideas and and getting some of the science down for it. He's one of the few people I've talked to that's really open to he suggestion. Definitely. Yeah, because there are some people that are like, nah, my recipe is solid. And it's like, well, is yeah. it? This hobby's only been I'm, there for a couple of years. <laughs> and in fact, I'm, I'm starting to use this substrate because I want to try it. Good. And I'm, good. I'm tired of making, you know, 50 gallons a month <laughs> myself. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what we talked about last week a little bit. We got into Kyle's talking about Kyle's substrate, but it's like, it's almost worth it to just buy the substrate now because it's not that expensive. And it's, yep to save you the time that you would put into mixing your own is it's totally worth it or to buy like 50 pound bags of all the different ingredients that you need to mix the right substrate. Like let someone else do that work yeah. um, and pay them for their time. Right then I can start calling pods again. <laughs> What's that? Then I can start calling pods again. I kind of <laughs> <laughs> ran out of time for all that. <laughs> right. I did, what is a good method to call? What do you think is like a better method than, I just collect them all just like I'm getting ready to ship them. Like okay. I have a, I have a, like a container that I tap the hides over. Okay. And, and then, then, then I just use a little plastic spoon to like separate them out if I need to do that. Okay. Do you just put the culls? Do you keep them around in another bin or do you freeze them? I, well, I separate them to where they belong, you know, like instead of them getting mixed together, like for example, oh, I, I don't know if you noticed there was like, and, and this is why I'm, almost hundred percent sure these red bees are going to be pretty true. Cause even when I look through those hundreds of them that are in there, I'll see like two or three yellow ones and the rest will be all red. You know what I mean? So I'll take the yellow ones out and put them in the yellow bee bin instead of in the red bee bin. <laughs> okay. That's fair. That's fair. I like that. I see, I get a lot of, I don't know if it's my bins or what, but I get a lot of like teleporters between my bins. So I'll find something from a different bin in, my magic potions were the ones that I was like, your name is appropriate because they would be in four other bins that I had. They were like my white dwarfs, right? They were getting they're, everywhere. They're hitchhiking. I know we yeah. like to say they teleport, but they're hitchhiking. Yeah, they're doing something. I don't know. But I was like, how are you in here? It was my uh, parasite that they totally infiltrated that bin. So it was like half and half at one point. And yeah. I thought it was a cool mix. So I just left them. Um, that's another one I think is amazing that, uh, especially when you get in the macro lenses, the magic potions and the witch's brew and all of those guys that are almost translucent with the colors underneath. Um, so the spikies are the new challenge. I, I They are for me anyway. I haven't heard anybody having really good success with them yet. Like I've had people like you're saying, like keep them alive, but they're not having a lot of breeding success or anything. Yeah. Jeremiah um, tools doing well with those ivories. That's who I got mine from. Okay. Okay. So but that's the one that kind of. Yeah. I mean, I've heard of sporadic success, except for um, spinosis. There's people doing really, really well with those. But like okay. the tie spikies and the um, white skull spikies, the white stripe spikies, I haven't heard of anybody that has them like super prolific yet. 
yeah, I wonder if that's one that we'll never really get super prolific, but hopefully, fingers crossed, I would love for something like that to become a little more common in the hobby where it's it's not like, uh, I can make a mortgage payment or get six isopods. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so right. it's like a six count. I don't know if you've seen any of those shows, but I, I'm so anti six count. I, I wish. F FPF. That's what I've called it for years now. What's FPF? What does that stand for? Five pod failure. <laughs> it's so true. I don't I, know. I honestly, I mean, and I believe a lot of it's intentional. To sell the five or six? Yeah. Yeah. Trying to slow competition or something like that. I think it's part that I know some of the breeders that still have six counts or five plus or whatever mm -hmm. it is on their page. And I think part of it is to try to intro people into it and make it more cost effective. Yeah. For some of the people I know, I don't think their mind is on like, let's curb the breeders. Because every probably, spot keeper I, becomes a breeder. Probably just my, my paranoia. I mean, and I know that I'm I'm probably, probably some people don't like what I do. Like if people often they may order five or six for me, but I give them 10 or 12 anyway. Just because I don't want to see him fail. <laughs> I mean, you want him to have that success. I don't. I I do think there's people out there that are like, no, you're going to get five because I don't want you to. Good luck. Good luck with these five isopods. Um, but I think your chance of failure is so much higher with a five count it or a six count it's than it is higher. with. Yeah, with even a ten or a twelve, like just bumping it up that much, is more than doubles your odds of success. I feel like. Um. I think we've all got success stories from getting a 12 count and turning it into a huge colony within a year, you know? And I guess my perspective is the more successful everyone is, the more the hobby grows and the more successful everyone is. I like that. I like that. I like the fact that a lot of people are not trying to be breeders now that people get into it, they get three, you know, species and get some success. And they're like, Oh, I could do this. I could be a breeder. And then they realize <laughs> how much actual time and effort goes into it. I, I, I'm more just a hobbyist that has too many pods. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think you're almost past hobbyist now. I think uh, there needs to be a new level for people that are really killing it and bringing that much information and uh, uh, livestock to the, uh, to the community. And I think from all I've heard and all I've seen and our conversations, like I just think you're doing a great, a great service to the hobby and everyone involved in ice pods. Um, I think it's fantastic, Eddie. So I want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank you for what you do to the hobby and for the hobby um, and your passion and all of that. And to continue to collaborate with other uh, keepers and, and other sides of the business to make it even better for everybody as time goes on to just evolve the hobby as it, because it's there, it's, it's in that stage now where it's going to evolve so much. I can't wait to see where this hobby is in 10 years. Now's the time to share, not keep secrets. I'm totally with you. I'm totally with you on that. And I appreciate you coming on with that mentality and that philosophy and to share some of your secrets with us today. Um, the idea of the mister, I hope people, I want to see 10 more of those this year on the show. I want to see that behind people, the mist system. <laughs> um, I think that's amazing. And I think the little fogger system for the spikies is amazing. And I feel like if you're going to pay that much for isopods, you want to have the best possible setup. Like that's part of the, you know what I mean? That's part of the investment is you can't just put them in a tub. Why would you put something that cool in a tub and never see it? Um, but yeah, I just want to thank you. Ed. So thank you so much for coming on. No problem. So, Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I hope someone learned something from this episode. I'm pretty sure you did. I know I did. Um, I didn't learn to say any names yet, but uh, <laughs> I'll get there. Next time, I'll know all of the names. <laughs> For real. Um, but thanks a lot, Ed. Um, and have a good night. You as Is well. Is there anything else? Just for everybody, I always do my best to answer everyone's questions if I can. Yeah, so uh, Ed's in, Eddie's in ISO Buddies, so just go ahead and, and throw a call out, and I'm sure that's a start, right? Yeah. And I'm easy Eddie everywhere, like on Reddit and discord. And I'm Edwin Lopez on Facebook. I don't have easy Eddie there, but everywhere else I'm easy Eddie. Okay. And it's easy. Why Eddie? Easy. Why E D D I E. Okay. You guys heard it here. So get on it. Bombard him with questions. 
<laughs> no, maybe not. Maybe not Bombard. I will uh, contest that uh, Eddie's super easy to talk to and super uh, open with info and ready to help at any time. So uh, everybody else, thanks for coming. I had a great time. Uh, this was a real treat for me. So thanks again, Eddie. All right. All right. Have a good night. You too. Thank you so much. Guys, that was awesome. Um, so that was easy, Eddie. I, yeah, this is not his thing. So I really appreciate him coming on. I appreciate Ryan Pavy and Kyle Bunch for getting me in touch with Eddie. Um, just such a good guy. Seriously, reach out if you have any questions. Um, we have a Facebook page. We have a Reddit, I think. I changed my Instagram to ISO Buddies um, from the Boo Bagger. So <laughs> that's a step up. Uh, we won't ever be on Twitter again. Uh, we have a Patreon. We want to support the show at one dollar level. It's a dollar a month. I mean, why not? Um, if not, that's fine. I love all my audience anyway. Uh, you guys are great. Thank you for sticking it out. This was a good one. Um, I could have talked to Eddie all night long, but I don't think that's his jam. But reach out to him. Talk to Eddie. He's an amazing resource to have in this hobby right now. So uh, it's kind of a Reddit. I don't really do anything with the Reddit. Oh, now Russ shows up. Probably filming his own show. Uh, like you on Instagram. Awesome. Oh, Pelly. By all means, thank you. Um, I don't want anyone to feel pressured to join us on Patreon, but I definitely it helps. And eventually we'll get to visit Russ. So, um, guys. Again, thank you. I'm kind of blown away. I don't know if you can tell. I'm like a little starstruck. So I, I had a whole lot of information that I didn't know I was going to get tonight. So uh, thank you so much, you guys. And uh, have a great night. And everybody, I hope you're healthy. I hope you stay healthy. All right.